care of the patient with musculoskeletal problems. Chapter 45 begins on page 983. Concepts are mobility, infection, and cellular regulation, and related are pain and perfusion. Osteoporosis. This shows um, the problems that are caused by osteoporosis. You can see how this bone looks kind of like Swiss cheese. The first part A here shows the size of a normal vertebral body compared with one affected by osteoporosis, which is the one on the right. Then below that you have the image of a normal bone. And then C is the osteoporotic bone. So you can see how much bone is missing in the C compared to the B. Okay, osteoporosis continued. This is a chronic disease of cellular regulation. There is decreased bone mass because of a loss of calcium. Now, this is a chronic metabolic disease in which bone loss is significant, causing decreased density and possible fracture. A fracture that will typically happen due to osteoporosis is called a fragility fracture. That's where the bone has grown so weakened that just getting up from a chair or walking may cause it to fracture. In other words, the patient doesn't have to fall or have something hit them, the bone just crumbles. Osteomalacia is the bone loss related to lack of vitamin D and osteopenia is a loss of bone mass. When you have osteoclastic activity that is greater, greater than osteoblastic activity, then you have osteopenia and osteoporosis. Um, the osteoclastic activity is when the bone is being destroyed or reabsorbed and osteoblastic means there is bone building activity happening. So if it's being destroyed more than it's being built, then you have a low bone mass. BMD stands for bone mineral density. Okay, this is how we diagnose osteoporosis. It determines the bone strength. It peaks between ages 25 to 30 years old. And it's how it is scored is it's called a T-score, okay? So if you see that term, you know what they're talking about. A T-score represents the number of standard deviation above or below the average BMD for young, healthy adults. So osteopenia is present when the T-score is below 1 and above negative 2.5. Excuse me, when the T-score is a negative 1 and above a negative 2.5. So you have to look at like the negative number scale. Osteoporosis is diagnosed in a person who has a T-score at or lower than negative 2.5. And at that case, they're going to be treated with bisphosphonates. Bisphosphonates. Medicare reimburses for BMD testing every two years in people 65 and older. So that's a pretty important um, test that they do. A lot of times osteoporosis is known as a silent disease because people do not know they have it until they get a fracture. This picture shows a normal spine at age 40 and then the osteoporotic changes at 60 and 70. This can result in a loss of height up to six inches and what is known as a dowager's hump, which is that um, that curvature of the upper vertebrae you see in that last figure. There is a great genetic component to osteoporosis, so you need to know if your grandmother or mother has it. Um, lifestyle and environmental factors. Menopause, women over age 65, men over age 75. A lean and thin body build in European American and Asian women, especially with a sedentary lifestyle. With nutrition, if you have a diet deficit in calcium and vitamin D, you know you have to have vitamin D and able to um, uptake calcium in your body, okay? So if you have a deficit of vitamin D, then you are also going to have a deficit in calcium. Also, malabsorption syndromes can um, cause osteoporosis. 
um, high intake of caffeine and carbonated beverages. So caffeine causes calcium to be lost in the urine and carbonated beverages result in high phosphorus intake, which also causes calcium loss. So it's a domino effect there. Excessive alcohol and tobacco use, a history of low trauma fracture after age 50, chronic low calcium intake, estrogen or androgen deficiency. Also, a protein deficiency can cause um, osteoporosis. Osteoporosis affects 44 million Americans. Um, if you look on page 985, there are gender health considerations that you should look at, um, patient-centered care, genetic and genomic considerations, and then assessing risk factors for primary osteoporosis on the bottom of the page there. There are also spiritual and cultural um, considerations. So if you look at that, body build, weight, and race, race, ethnicity seem to influence who gets the disease. Osteoporosis occurs most often in older, lean-built Euro-American and Asian women, particularly those who don't exercise regularly. However, African Americans are at risk for decreased vitamin D, which is needed for adequate calcium absorption in the small intestine. Um, things that people prefer in their diets, also avoiding the sun or an inability to afford high nutrient food can influence a person's rate of bone loss. So think about what happens when you go out in the sun, you absorb vitamin D. So if you're never in the sun, that doesn't help you, okay? Back to the protein deficiency, um, this affects cellular regulation. There, 50% of serum calcium is protein bound. So we need protein for calcium also. For our promotion of health and wellness, teaching should begin with young women who begin to lose bone after 30 years of age. The focus of osteo porosis prevention is to decrease modifiable risk factors. So what would those be? Ensure adequate calcium intake. So not just dairy, but dark green leafy vegetables also contain a lot of calcium. Sun exposure and adequate dietary vitamin D. Limit carbonated beverages, avoid sedentary lifestyle. It's really good to do weight bearing exercises. That is what builds our bones. We want to avoid activities that jar the bones, however. We want to limit, cal uh, excuse me, limit caffeine and limit alcohol and tobacco. Walking for 30 minutes three to five times a week is the single most effective exercise for osteoporosis prevention. Um, this can also occur in anorexia and bulimic patients, so we want to keep an eye on uh, patients with eating disorders. The best defense against osteoporosis in later adulthood is building strong bones and appropriate health and lifestyle practices that prevent the disease. So prevention is the key. When taking a history, have they fallen before? Have they had a fracture before? Okay. Um, do they have the presence of a dowager's hump? or kyphosis, that's what the hump is technically called. Lordosis is in the lower back, scoliosis. Do they have any decrease in height? Do they have back pain after bending, lifting, or stooping that is sharp? Pain is worse with activity and relieved with rest. Back pain accompanied by tenderness and voluntary restriction of spinal movement suggests one or more compression vertebral fractures. So Compression, compression fractures in the vertebrae, okay? Um, this is the most common type of osteoporotic fracture. So they will need a x-ray of their spine in order to see what's going on with their um, vertebrae. And they probably will follow up with an MRI with that as well. Psychosocially, the biggest problem is um, their body image because for instance, if they get the dowager's hump, they lose height. Um, all of those, you know, take a toll on us mentally. 
Of course, laboratory-wise, we're going to look at serum calcium and vitamin D3. For our imaging, we want to do x-rays of the spine and long bones. The DEXA scan, DXA for short, um, is a bone mineral density or BMD and a bone mineral content test. So it shows both, okay? Um, they don't have to fast to have a DEXA scan. They have to remove all metallic objects that might be scanned. Um, they have to lie supine. And a photon generator and x-ray pass above and below the lumbar spine. Feet are placed on a brace that rotates the hip and then the arm, and it takes about 15 minutes. There's no discomfort, and um, that's what computes the T-score that we talked about, okay? The QCT measures bone density, especially sensitive to vertebral changes. It's more expensive than the DEXA scan and the patient gets more radiation, so it's not done as much. Then we have vertebral imaging, the MRI, like I was saying, um, they'll do an MRI sometimes to make sure they're seeing everything they need to see more than the x-ray. All right, the priority problem for these clients with osteoporosis or osteopenia is potential for fractures due to weak porous bone tissue. Planning and implementation, what are we going to do for these patients? Well, nutritionally, we talked about what they need to be eating. They will also need vitamin D and calcium supplements. Um, calcium carbonate is not a treatment, but is good for prevention, all right? So like OSCAL, um, things like that, Citracal. You want to typically tell them to take their medications with food because of gastric um, acid being needed for absorption. So gastric acid obviously is increased when um, you're digesting, when people are eating and they're trying to digest food. So that will help with the absorption of the calcium supplement. Um, as far as drug therapy, the bisphosphonates, I keep wanting to say biphosphonates, but it's bisphosphonates. They prevent bone loss and increase bone density. Things such as Fosamax, Boniva, Actimel, you may have seen this in clinical or you've seen it um, commercials on television. These are used for treatment and prevention for postmenopausal women. Also approved for osteoporosis in men. So this one they need to take on an empty stomach 30 minutes before a meal with a full glass of water and stay upright for 30 minutes after taking because it can cause an inflammation of the esophagus and gastric ulcers. If the oral preparation is not effective, they can get an IV. There are also selective estrogen receptor modulators, which mimic estrogen. They prevent bone loss and increase bone density. This is used for treatment and prevention in postmenopausal women as well. There is a contraindication when the patient has a history of VTE, you remember venous thromboembolism. Um, liver disease also um, can be a contraindication, so we want to monitor liver function tests. Calcitonin is another thyroid hormone that is given. This thyroid hormone decreases bone loss. It is used for the treatment of osteoporosis. It is derived from semen, and it can be given sub-Q or intranasally. So the nasal route is preferred due to the convenience and decreased side effects, okay? And you want to alternate nares if you're given something like that intranasally. You want to alternate nares um, to prevent mucosal irritation. And it also must be refrigerated, by the way. Now, there are androgens that are used to decrease bone reabsorption and increase bone growth in men. In women, the problem with it is it can cause muscular traits or masculine traits and also lead to liver disease. So I have to be careful with that. As far as lifestyle changes, we talked about that they need to be exercising, including weight-bearing exercises. Something that I want to talk about when we're talking about educating our patients in home management 
We also need to educate other healthcare professionals about the need to screen patients for low vitamin D levels. For any at-risk patient, we need to teach them what foods are high in calcium and vitamin D, and also the importance of adequate daily sunlight, okay? Um, we want to teach them preventative measures such as increasing their vitamin D through dietary intake, which includes milk, soy, rice, eggs, chicken, liver, and enriched cereals and breads, sun exposure and supplements. Cheese and yogurt do not have adequate vitamin D. They only have calcium. Anyone that's homebound needs to get five minutes of sun every day. So when we say adequate sun exposure, we're not talking about they have to go out and lay out for an hour or two. They just need to at least get out five minutes a day. We want to um, make sure they understand all that and make sure that they know to report any bone pain that is aggravated by activity or worse at night, bone tenderness to palpation, skeletal malalignment, um, and any muscle weakness, any problems with their gait, any cramping, if they become unsteady, um, or kind of walk with a waddle that they didn't have before. Osteomyelitis is an actual infection of the bone. This can be caused by bacteria, viruses, or fungus. It occurs from an infection, an underlying disease, or a non-penetrating trauma. Um, an example is a UTI that spreads to the lower vertebrae. Long-term catheters such as Hickman catheters, dialysis or IV drug users, salmonella infections of the GI tract may also spread to the bone. Poor dental hygiene can cause it in facial bones. So very important um, education to do there. Symptoms of osteomyelitis, bone pain, fever, heat and redness in the area of the infected bone, elevated white blood cell, and the um, ESR may raise later in the disease course. So the um, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, okay? Low initially, but then will rise as the disease gets worse. Non-surgical management of osteomyelitis includes antibiotics. Patients will often be hospitalized at first. They may need IV antibiotics, and it may be that they have more than one that they're getting. Um, surgically, they can go in and scrape that necrotic bone out of there and allow that bone to revascularize itself and grow um, good bone again. They can put a graft over it to uh, help it, and that is called a sequestrectomy. Benign versus malignant bone tumors. Bone tumors are either cancerous or not. Um, the most common benign bone tumor is the osteochondroma. This is typically involving the femur and tibia. If you have a malignant bone tumor, it's either classified as primary or metastatic. Most bone tumors are going to be metastatic, so they are coming from cancer that originates somewhere else in the body. And the main um, problem you're going to see with bone, any kind of bone cancer is going to be pain. So it's very painful, um, and it also is a cause for falls and fractures. With your assessment, like I said, pain is going to be the, the main thing you're going to see the patient complaining about. There may be local swelling in the area where the tumor is, and of course fever um, as your body's trying to fight that invasive tumor. Diagnostic testing includes x-rays, CT, MRI. They can do a bone needle biopsy and also lab studies um, to determine what type of tumor it is. Interventions for bone tumors. Non-surgically, we do chemo, radiation, and microwave ablation. The purpose is to shrink a tumor with any of these, okay? Um, the microwave ablation is done with moderate sedation or general anesthesia, 
and it kills the targeted tissue with heat using microwaves. Um, most patients have pain relief or control after an MWA, and that is the point, again, of chemo, radiation, all of it, is to shrink the tumor and to give them pain relief. Surgically, we can remove a tumor. Um, usually, there is a combination of radiation and chemotherapy that goes along with that. And they can remove, I mean, they may remove a primary malignant tumor or a um, metastasis malignant tumor. As far as home care, patients with metastatic bone tumors are often placed on hospice care. Um, if there's no one to support them at home, they may be um, admitted to a long-term health care facility. The biggest problem is, of course, safety and mobility, along with pain. Um, but the patient, you know, they may have to have a walker or wheelchair. They'll need a good support system to help them with their ADLs. They may need home health, um, and they may need further um, chemotherapy or further treatment. Um, home health also will assist with pain management, and hospice, of course, would also do that. Okay, disorders of the hand. This is on page 997 of your text. Diputrin's contracture is a slowly progressive contracture of the palmar fascia, resulting in flexion of the fourth or fifth digit of the hand. You can see this on um, page 997, figure 45.3. The cause of this is unknown. It occurs in older Euro-American men, occurs in families, and is bilateral. So if you have it in one hand, you will have it in the other. This requires a surgical release by cutting the fascia in the hand. They may have to use a splint after surgical dressing is removed. Now the ganglion cyst is a round benign cyst often found on the wrist or foot joint or tendon. It can disappear and reappear. It's usually painless on palpation. Occurs around ages 15 to 50, so that's a wide range. It can be aspirated or surgically removed. Or you can put your hand on a table and slam a big book on it. Apparently that used to be the treatment back in the day. Not for me, but somebody did that. <laughs> All right, disorders of the foot. Hallux valgus deformity. This is just a bunion, commonly known as a bunion often seen in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the hammer toe, the second toe is deformed. Let's see if there's a picture. Yes, look at um, page 998, figure 45-4. You actually have a bunion and hammer toes. So you see how the toes kind of cross over on each other. Those are hammer toes. Plantar fasciitis is an inflammation of the plantar fascia. Now this is located in the arch of the foot. Seen in middle to older adults and athletes, especially adult runners. Obesity may be a contributing factor. I think being a nurse is a contributing factor, being on your feet a lot. It causes severe pain in the arch of the foot, especially when getting out of bed. It worsens with weight bearing. Treatment is rest, ice, stretching, strapping of the foot to maintain the arch or in, and shoes with good arch support or you know those um, foot in, uh, shoe inserts. You can use ibuprofen or steroids for pain and inflammation control. They may remove tissue with an endoscopic surgery. I don't know about the surgery but I have had plantar fasciitis and it is extremely painful, like nauseatingly painful can be. Um, and the reason it hurts when you get out of bed is that muscles is kind of, or the arch is kind of contracted, everything's kind of tight. And so stretching the foot um, can be really helpful. Some people take a rolling pin and roll it across their foot. All kinds of interesting treatments. Okay, as usual, you can go over the case study on your own and the questions. And I will see you in lecture. Thank you.